guessing you're here for the same reason I am. You think some of the ideas out there in modern day marketing land are a bit flat, a bit dull, and you're looking to hear something different. Maybe something original or something with a bit of passion and soul. Well, we have just the group of people for you. I'm Michelle Lomas, and this is the Flex Your Hustle podcast brought to you by Commission Factory. Thanks for joining us, and let's get hustling. My Muscle Chef started in 2013 with two brothers working towards one dream, being able to enjoy great tasting healthy food without ever having to cook for themselves. The company targets time poor and health conscious individuals who want a convenient healthy meal. That sounds like most people I know. Well, the time poor part, anyway. In 2022, this renowned food company in Australia delivers over 1.6 million meals every month across four and a half thousand Australian suburbs. That's impressive. With the Australian ready-made meal market expected to grow to an Australian $1.6 billion by 2024, My Muscle Chef is a brand that's poised to grow with the trends. But ready-made meals is a pretty crowded market. So how does My Muscle Chef get an edge and continue to grow? The answer may lie in data, and that is the realm that my guest today plays in. Ashley Gardner leads the data team at My Muscle Chef. They provide insights and analysis for multiple departments across the business so they can always improve planning and performance based off data-driven decisions and processes. And what's fascinating is how the whole business has transformed into a data-driven culture and embrace data-driven decision-making. Let's hear from her now. So thank you for joining us today. Really interested to hear more about the My Muscle Chef story. I doubt there's a listener on this podcast who hasn't heard of you guys, tried you guys maybe, given it a crack or is a loyal customer. There's going to be a lot of people interested in how you grew and how you scaled and all the unique things that you do to kind of grow that customer base in what is quite frankly, extremely cluttered and competitive market. What's the story? How did you guys scale and what does your business look like today? So way, way back in 2013, Tashara and Nash founded the business. They were kind of both Egg and tag going to the gym and fitness, being young professionals venturing out into the workforce, didn't really have a lot of time for meal prepping. And so they looked to find something that filled that gap and there was really nothing you know, outside of light and easies and that kind of thing, which is not really if you're going to the gym and, and trying to get big, it's not quite the right thing for you. So uh, yeah, really wasn't anything in the market, so they kind of were like, well, we could do this and so they got started I mean it really started as a family affair with their dad as well as hiring a few kind of key people in the kitchen and delivery staff and stuff growing quite quickly even sort of from the beginning organically through like word of mouth referrals through their gym circles and stuff and that initial early days really was lots of bodybuilders it was a lot of it was chicken broccoli and rice and that was kind of um, that sort of high protein macros measured out to the very smallest detail and so that kind of started getting quite a bit of like a cult following uh, around the place. And that actually worked really well for expanded outside of Sydney into Victoria and Queensland and still really organic. Not a lot of actual advertising or marketing going into it. Lots of referrals, lots of samplings at gyms and just kind of people talking to each other. Did I read somewhere that the guys were basically going into gyms all day, every day and introducing themselves and like throwing sampling around like that real down to the bones I'm a startup and I'm just gonna you know get amongst it and do what I can yeah so going out they would be hitting the streets to get in front of people and get the food in front of people because they knew that once people tried it they'd be hooked but then that's obviously not just what they were doing they were also cooking and packing and delivering and just kind of taking care of everything so a lot of uh, a lot of hard work uh, went in in the sort of early days and yeah and then so all of the meals initially were frozen and so that meant that you know it's easy to to store easy to deliver and in 2018 we decided to make them move to fresh food and that was a big operational change but then it coincided with a lot of other changes that we made in the business at the same time so around moving away from just like a really solid gym rat kind of bodybuilder protein is life kind of aesthetic for the brand and for the target audience we'd done some research into the brand and so we were kind of you know people had heard about us but a lot of people were really put off by the really masculine branding I think like in a lot of research that we'd done and that we did in those early days a lot of women just kind of were like sure it looks healthy but I don't think it's suitable for me and so it's hard to scale to the degree that we you know the name small company wants to alienating 50% of 
potential audience. So There wasn't much of the trend as there is now for women to be fit and strong and healthy and back then it was still kind of like the waif thin so there was that fear of like I don't want to get bulked up like those guys if I eat that sort of food I'm gonna get so I'm sure you're fighting a little bit of that as well. So yeah, so that kind of, we were like, okay, we need to sort of soften the brand a bit while making that change to, to fresh food and kind of focusing on like, actually it's lots of people want to be fit and fuel themselves in a healthy way without spending hours meal prepping every Sunday beyond just that cult bodybuilding kind of community. So um, it started to expand our reaches. I have a quote here from your founder, Tisha Menon. It's an article from Smart Company 2019, and I think he says it really well. First five years, we made a lot of mistakes. We were presuming our customer was some bodybuilder type. But as the company grew, it became increasingly clear the My Muscle Chef customer was much more aspirational. Health conscious professionals looking for meals good enough for athletes. We did a lot of research and changed our focus to become a more data-driven company. We had to understand exactly who our customer is. They just want those meals that are healthy and have a lot of protein. It sounds like 2018 was a very pivotal moment for you in the business, you know, when you realised and some hard truths that maybe you were building quite a niche that wasn't going to help you scale in the way that you wanted to. So lots of changes in the business, not only by the sounds of it from the product and the packaging and the branding, but also really transforming yourself into this data-driven business. Yeah, so uh, so lots of, lots of changes. Obviously, operationally, changing from a frozen product to a fresh product was a huge change um a huge risk as well because obviously that's how our customers had always sort of known us so immediately we were sort of changing everything that they knew and liked about us to to then kind of meet their sort of broader needs from wider sort of audience but then yeah also kind of refining the brand and making it less much less masculine really painting ourselves into a corner with a lot of the sort of heavy bodybuilder focus but I think the success of that uh, has sort of shown within the business that using data and insights to sort of make decisions generally pays off and so there's a lot it's, it's actually a really strong data culture within within the company which is great lots of uh, people are not afraid to make mistakes as long as you are learning from them I think. So how are you using data in your business today? I mean we use data for basically everything so whether it's from a logistics and operations forecasting demand so they can get the raw ingredients or roster the staff to work the factory and what meals we need to produce and what quantities all the way through to our marketing is all data driven and so looking at what's working what combinations things are working that sort of culture of curiosity and questioning is really encouraged and so everyone's got access to relevant data so they can kind of explore and see what's happening there's a lot everyone's always asking questions which is fantastic as you know leading the data team the number of inquiries we get from just random people across the business going hey I was thinking about this do we have any data on this what would this look like what's this sort of mean and so it's actually fantastic people are thinking about it it's not a get in do your job get out it's kind of like thinking outside those bounds as well to kind of look at where where else we can improve what's the ways that we can find those efficiencies oh, I love that you've built this culture of curiosity now the companies that you talk to the data side of things is always kind of separated from the day-to-day in a way or they kind of come in last minute but it sounds like it's very much ingrained in your business and everybody in the business has access to that data to be able to sort of inform those decisions. I guess when you think about data you never think about actually the logistics of your business and especially now we're going through so much inflation the cost of things are increasing so I'm sure even today you're sort of looking at that data a lot more closely in terms of the cost to create and distribute and what that looks like from a price point perspective. Yeah, and I think one of the best things is we've been establishing a lot of the foundational data infrastructure and requirements so that we have now in a place where we don't have to kind of scramble to find this data or use proxies in a lot of places because we've been collecting it, been looking at it, and so we can kind of identify efficiencies and find places that we can improve things across the business to, to help with those sorts of external factors because there's things you can control and things you can't control, and um, unfortunately all of the um, those external things, it's just sort of a yeah. take them as they come. So in 2019, you decided to bring data into the business in a very different way, and that required a tremendous amount of infrastructure. 
I am sure that didn't happen overnight, or did it? Yeah, it was quite a big process. I think we started the data function 2019, and that was literally just me putting things together and kind of connecting the dots as of early last year in a place where there's a first phase. The goal was, did not want to hear people saying anymore, oh, we just don't have data on that. We just don't know. And so January last year was kind of where we really stopped hearing that from people across the business because it became really clear we do have data on everything and people have access to it and they know what's available and they're actively seeking that out and having conversations and wanting to to use that for making decisions. So that was brilliant. And now what we've kind of been working on the last year or so is that next stage, obviously, insights and reporting is fantastic, but then we want to do more than that. How do we deliver better customer experiences, whether it's through recommendations or customized content on the site and, and all these sorts of things, playing with machine learning to enhance our segmentation of customers to better be able to tailor how we talk to them. From this kind of key moment in 2018, where you had a hard look at what you were doing and made a big pivot, started your data infrastructure and building that out to sort of stretch across your entire business. What's happened since then, growth-wise? I think that the business has continued to take off. We're now uh, available in retail stores across the country. Annual revenue run rate is about seven times what it was in the 2018-2019 financial year, so just kind of growing hugely. The other piece that we've seen a lot of strides in as well, which is I think really indicative of the fact that we're making the right decisions is, is increases in customer loyalty. So in terms of how frequently people order from us and how often they sort of come back, that again continues to increase repeat customer orders, increasing nearly 50% year on year, which is insane. Like it, it really validates the direction we're moving in and the decisions mm. that we're making are the right ones. You've done something so phenomenal. It's not just like a unit that looks at marketing, but it's data across your entire business. and really affecting culture of your company as well with everybody now looking to data to validate some ideas or innovation that they want to try. What's your advice? What would you give people listening and maybe some warning points as well? Because I'm sure it's not smooth sailing. I think the biggest factor that's contributed to the success of building a data culture has been no one is afraid to admit if they're wrong, which is, I think, so important. Maybe you've got a gut feel about something and then you kind of look into it and the data says, actually, mm-hmm. it's, your, it's confirmation bias. You're yeah. looking at a really small thing. This is not actually indicative of a broader trend. And so actually just being okay with being wrong, which it's got to be a top-down piece. And, and so within our business, it's super humble. There's no egos and, and that kind of nonsense kind of getting in the way. <laughs> Such a great point. How many people in our industry, we look at the data And it doesn't affirm what we wanted to believe. So we spin the data or we find additional sources of data that reaffirm what we're trying to do. And I guess that's also a case for the importance of having this separate, almost independent team that's validating a lot of this stuff because it's too easy to go in with your own bias and look at data the way that you want it to. Absolutely. And I think that that's a huge thing, being able to look at it objectively. It is really easy to kind of go, oh, okay, actually, well, this doesn't say what I want it to. So maybe if I present it like this or uh, <laughs> let's just change the scale here and then this graph. Yeah, exactly. the, the scaling on the graph, the old, that old <laughs> nugget. Oh, my God. Yikes. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like watch outs, the, the main thing is is just it's not – a quick fix. I think a lot of the underlying work when it comes to getting all your data sources together, doing all the cleaning and modeling and even getting it into a place where you're able to start analyzing it and having these broadly accessible reports that answer any questions that you want. It's actually quite a long process if you want accuracy and reliability. There's, you know, It takes time and so it's not expecting, oh, well, we've, we implemented a data team three months ago. Why aren't we Yes. Why haven't we solved this yet? It's kind of an ongoing sort of piece. It does take time, but it's worth it in the end. And are you constantly tinkering? Because it seems like with data, you have to continue to tinker with the model, with the method, things evolve, and it does take time to sort of see those patterns come through. So how long does it take 
from the time you set something up and feel like it's running to actually be able to make decisions off the back of that data? And then is that a constant iteration? Yeah, so it, I mean, it depends on what our data source is, right? So your core business data, whether it's your transactions, understanding what orders are coming in, what products people are buying, that doesn't change very often. And so once you've gotten that all together, put it in an analytics database or a warehouse, then that's pretty set and ready to go. That's an easy place to start. I think that the iteration really comes from different ways of slicing those sort of data sets with other data sets, whether it's combining our online sales data with our retail sales data to kind of understand the interplay between the two of those in various places. Or if it's, uh, you know, we implemented a behavioral tracking across our website and app beginning of last year. And so that's like a huge amount of brand new data that sort of came in. And, uh, and so the scale of it and the sheer number of rows and potential each of those rows could be that's massive piece to model and get into a place where you're really comfortable with using it for reporting i think it took us maybe four to six months before we were kind of really happy with it we're also always adding new events to track or new context as we want to drill down a bit deeper for our digital product and ux sort of decisions it really depends on what it is you're looking to do but your core data sets i think once you've got those locked down you shouldn't be making a huge amount of changes to that structure too frequently from an actionable perspective you are relying on other people so there's only so far you can do from a data perspective Uh, like you said you know if you're looking at behavioural insights on the website and the website experience. That's great. You can report on that and you can give it to the UX team. But if you don't have that culture of being a data-driven company, it's probably far less likely that that is going to get actioned at a fast rate. But I imagine, given your culture is is so data-focused, that it happens a lot quicker. So the product team and data team are super intertwined, actually, which is brilliant. I mean, I think in order to make the best product decisions, it really does need to be based in data. And so that kind of made sense for us to structure the teams that way. And then we also obviously work really closely with marketing as well. And so there's always a data representative when it comes to key strategic decisions around these sorts of things to kind of go, actually, I think we could pull some data on this or do we want to validate this? And I think we could actually look, let's just check that. And so it means that we're able to just, when people need that data or when they've got those questions, we can just make sure it's there for them and that they're able to do everything they need to do. From a marketing perspective, you kind of use all the traditional channels, social, you know, search, etc. And of course you do. But I know affiliate and influencer marketing is a really big part of your marketing practice. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do in that space? We started using affiliates late 2020 and it was kind of a bit of an experiment. It was something that has sort of been knocked about I, even back then. I mean, now the sort of inflation on Facebook and Google cost is out of control, but even back then you kind of start to see the signs and you realise that it's quite risky to just have all of your digital spend in the two platforms. So looking at ways to diversify and the affiliates piece, I think it's not something that a lot of people have experience with. It's still kind of a bit outside of people's sphere of knowledge there was a bit of trepidation internally or we just going to be discounting everything and just kind of training people it's going to be the group on effect and it's going to be terrible and so uh, I've sort of overcoming those objections to just go let's give it a shot let's just see how it goes we'll stick to our normal kind of approach of we're not competing on price we're competing on quality and it's sort of taken off since then so using commission factory since October 2020 and so success from affiliates from an acquisition perspective has been really phenomenal for us so the cost per acquisition from the affiliate channel is about 70% lower than it is from Google or Facebook advertising channels which is just it's that's ridiculous Um, and uh, with the kind of increasing costs constantly across those platforms it makes it a really efficient way for us to scale and get new people on board in terms of being able to control your costs from that perspective there's low risk because you literally pay for conversions that come through there's no wastage like there is you know you give Facebook half a million dollars and they'll go let's see if we can find anything for you or they'll just balance stuff well we drove all these people to your website and it's like well they weren't qualified audiences and therefore they didn't convert so there's no value in that for me and it baffles me why everybody isn't doing affiliate marketing because you do literally only pay for the conversion it's such a 
great way to scale your business without a lot of the upfront risk. And certainly what we're seeing is that conversion rates are not as good as what they used to be. Cost per conversion is so much higher. So yeah, it's really important to find those other ways to drive sales. And it actually reminds me, um, you did mention to me that, you know, in a category that's so built on price promotion, get your first box free or get your first box 50% off or your first three for like $100. You guys don't do that ever, do you? No, no. And that was a conscious decision that we've made since the very beginning is that it seems to be quite the norm in the category to discount really heavily. But then you kind of, it's just giving giving your food away for free. And I think it really does train people to, they won't buy from you unless there is a sale on. Like you look at reviews for some of our competitors and a lot of, yeah, the food's okay, but it's not worth buying unless there's a sale, but there's a sale every other week. We don't want to train people into that mindset from us because our food is worth paying for. We're very confident in who we are and the value that we have as a brand and kind of what we have to offer. We never really felt pressure to go down that path as well. The data piece really comes into that. So relying really heavily on data for informing decisions that we are making for new products that we're launching, whether that's new meals or new product ranges. As an example, we just launched a new range of plus meals, which are a few of our most popular core menu items, but they are just giant servings because <laughs> some people... you got to cater to the original audience. <laughs> That's it. And, you know, it's kind of something that people have been wanting when we've launched new meals that are in that are sort of higher calorie ranges. They tend to do really, really well. And so we're just like, well... Let's make these same meals that are heaps bigger. Mm. And yeah, and so that's kind of been phenomenal results so far. It's so obvious and so smart, yet I don't think brands think about this often enough. It's it's all about getting the customer in, but you're so much more focused on that lifetime value. And it's so true. You sure get the customer in, they'll try it. But if the quality isn't there, they won't come back, you know, because they've tried it. Just curious, I'd, I'd love to hear from you, if there are marketers thinking about getting into the affiliate space, what advice would you give them? Obviously, you've seen some great success. You still use influencer marketing though, right? So it's it's not like you use one or the other, you use a combination. But what advice would you give them? Yes, so definitely still using influencers and ambassadors. And the success of affiliates has really redefined the way that we approach influencers and using them sort of a bit more like the affiliate network to actually maximize the value you get from that sort of channel. But I think from an advice perspective for anyone thinking about affiliates, it's not, and this was the, the hurdle we sort of internally had to overcome before we ever really got on board, was it's not just one thing. It doesn't have to be all offer driven. It doesn't have to be just heavy discounting. It doesn't have to be spammy ads that are following people around the internet. It can kind of fit in with your brand and the way that you want to be perceived while still being super effective. And again, the whole thing is just testing things out, trying things and seeing what happens and learning from that and building and scaling from there. Yeah, so true. All right, so last question I'm going to ask you, tell me some of the things that you've tried that didn't quite work out. The, the failures. <laughs> yeah, um, I think one of the biggest disappointments, I think, from, I mean, and this was something that I'd sort of put together uh, and I was like very disappointed um, when this did not work but um, it was Twitter so obviously Australians don't really use Twitter as a day-to-day -day kind of thing unless you're a journalist which is a kind of you know I'm from New Zealand and there's actually quite an active Twitter community so sort of coming over here I was just like there must be it's very strange yeah we must be the only market that don't obsess over Twitter. Yeah, but sort of looking in the, you know, looking at the trends and so for me sort of actually just being on Twitter and kind of noticing things and, and digging a bit deeper into the data around it was there are sort of, there are key situations where Australians will use Twitter mm. and so that is reality TV shows. So if you've uh, ever watched maths, then oh the live tweeting along with that is... The memes are spectacular. This is where, this is where Australia's humour... <laughs> comes out during a maths episode jump onto twitter and you'll see funny the funniest people in australia that's it and so and like so that's sort of a big thing that's like probably the most engagement like actual engagement that twitter 
gets from Australians. Um, and then the other time that people are on Twitter but are not necessarily tweeting things is for uh, sports events. So for things like MMA or yeah. Formula One. So uh, people uh, will be following uh, people on Twitter. They'll be, they'll be following along with those topics and those conversations, but mm. they're not necessarily doing anything they're not ta- they're, there's not hot takes or anything from them it's just kind of they're wanting to see what other people are saying and it's kind of more of a observational kind of piece um and so it was kind of like well both of these groups of people are definitely my muscle chef kind of consumers sort of different sides of it so the reality show like you're just wanting to kind of get in you get home from work you're wanting to just kind of settle down with the glass of wine and some food that you don't have to cook or clean up. You can just pay attention to the show. Great. Or, you know, the people watching sports and stuff. It's kind of, a, a, again, it's a, that sort of typically younger male demographic, um, especially from like the MMA sort of perspective. So, um, again, really strong representation in our audiences. So we were like, let's give it a go. We'll find times where there's these audiences are likely to be online will kind of target uh, ads sort of at that time to these sorts of these sorts of topics and, and, and people and followers to um, and sort of see what sort of traction we get and it just yeah flop miserably they were just like uh, you know we'd get a bit of a bit of traffic not a huge amount very minimal conversions um, and more than any other platform <laughs> there was just people getting really mad at seeing ads. <laughs> um, and so it was just kind of a little bit disheartening. It was just like... It got a bit cranky at you, did they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah big mad. So we were just like, okay, well, we tried it and it uh, failed. And so, you know, even if you've got the, the insights, sometimes it just doesn't always... Mm. You know, there's other things that you can't always know. Like, But, um, but yeah, so Twitter users are not something... Don't don't love the ads, uh, so yeah. <laughs> it's a great learning, to be honest, and it does it does baffle me that the Twitter audience here in Australia is is quite unique compared to the rest of the world. So yeah, maybe that'll change in the future. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Who knows what Elon's going to do with Twitter? So we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have said for ages, people, I mean, Australians love getting mad at things and love shortening words. So I always thought that Twitter would be ideal totally. for them. Totally. And it's just, yeah, bonkers that it's just is not, yeah. it's just not a fit. So no love, no yeah. love. <laughs> it's very strange. Well, Ashley, thank you so much. Thanks for joining the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Really great conversation. Really interesting what you guys have done and how brave you were to just take that moment and pivot your entire business and and see where it went so thank you for sharing that with us today thanks to ashley gardner from my muscle chef for joining us on flex your hustle have you hit the follow button on this podcast in your podcast app it helps us a lot if you do it helps even more if you tell a friend about the show and they do it too coming up next time on flex your hustle so what sort of publishers do you have on your network? What sort of publishers can brands access? Yeah, it's it's been a really cool journey. So we started here in Australia and we got some of our favorite ones on board. So your broadsheets and your urban list, ones that we really vibe with. And then there was success there, if mm. I put it that way. Mm-hmm. And then it became quite easy to go, hey, next publisher on the block, do you also like to create great content with complete freedom and how you want to do it mm. no no rounds of revision because it works similar to PR and there's a whole new non-cannibalizing revenue line where you can effectively monetize your editorial team without having any of those long-winded partnerships going on yes was the answer to most of them so mm. the answer is who's who in the zoo Flex Your Hustle is brought to you by Commission Factory and produced by Ample I'm Michelle Lomas Keep hustling and bye for now.